Hello, and welcome to Unit 6 of an Introduction to Agent-Based Modeling. In this unit, we're going to be discussing how to analyze the agent-based models. And this, of course, brings up the age-old question, now that you have an agent-based model, what are you going to do with it? Right? So the kind of standard answer is that you're going to uh, modify some of the inputs and output uh, inputs to the model and then look at what the outputs generate and from that analyze the results. Right? And that's kind of the, the main answer that we go through. And all of this unit is essentially going to be about doing that. Right? How do you change the inputs in a, in a strategic way? How do you make get the outputs collected in a strategic way? How do you look at those outputs and look at what they result? Right? Um, so to do that, I want to bring a new model into discussion uh, because I want to have a model we can play with. And this is actually in some ways related uh, to the model that we constructed in uh, Unit 4 uh, in that it is, in fact, a disease spreading model. And in Unit 4, what we were looking at was an information spread model, right? Uh, and now we're looking at actually a physical disease, right? Uh, and this is an important and kind of interesting uh, model to take a look at. It's a model that's used in a lot of different contexts. In fact, it is in some ways the basis for a lot of the information spread models out there. Um, but the basic idea is the following, right? Um, if you have a disease, uh, you have an individual who's infected, and that individual can affect five people before the original person recovers. This is sometimes referred to as the R naught of the disease, right? The basic uh, uh, reproduction factor of the disease. Then in three steps of the infection, right, the disease is going to infect 156 people um, because the first person infects five people, those people each infect five people, and those people each infect five people. So in that third step, you have 125 people infected. At the previous step, you had 25 to make 150. The previous step for that, you had five people to 155, and then the one person, the original spreader of, uh, so 156 total. On the other hand, in a lot of cases, right, diseases are spreading within a contained community, and thus the number of possible infections is going to quickly tail off because the disease may run out of new hopes. Right? Um, so we want to investigate the relationship between this uh, fast growth example and uh, the resource limits, essentially, that might happen. And that, those two notions occur in a lot of complex systems that are interesting to look at outside the disease, which is why we're talking about it. Um, now, that, that model I just described is kind of the, st the standard SIR type approach, uh, with, which, is, which is the way it's referred to. It means susceptible, infected, and recovered type of approach to modeling disease spread. In fact, in this case, uh, really, we're just talking about susceptible and infected in many cases. Uh, but there are other complications that that model doesn't take into account, right? For instance, that model assumes that there is uniform mixing within the population. In other words, every person has an equally likely probability of interacting with everybody else. We know that's not the case, right? I don't interact with the same people every day, but there are some people who I'm much more likely to interact with than others, right? Um, there's also a different susceptibilities to disease, right? So some people might be more susceptible to diseases than other people's, the other people, and Finally, there's the possibility for environmental interactions, right? It may be the case that maybe certain diseases are airborne, for instance, and so they spread within a contained area for a little while. Um, and so it might not just be the, the people that I actually meet, but the people who have been in the area that I was in recently, right? So because of all those things, right, there are ways that we could improve upon this standard model. And so an ancient based model is a good way uh, to take a look at the spread of disease. So uh, we built a special model just for this chapter in the textbook, and so I'm going to use that throughout this unit uh, to look at what's going on. Uh, and so um, let me pause for a second here, and we'll go over and look at that model. Okay, here you have the spread of disease model, and in case you're having trouble finding it, it's in the uh, NetLogo Models Library under um, IABM textbook, under chapter six, spread of disease. So I'm not going to open it again because it'll change my dimensions. But uh, here you go. Here's the model right here, right? Um, and you'll notice it has a couple of different parameters. I just want to talk through those. I'm going to switch this. It defaults to network variant, but we're going to use the mobile variant when we first start. So I'm going to switch that. As a result, you can ignore the connections per node and disease decay. Um, you, but we do want to look at number of infected, number of people, and things like that. And so, we can hit the setup, and when we hit setup, you'll see it creates a bunch of individuals scattered throughout the world. Most of them are gray, indicating that they don't have the disease yet, but there are three that are red, right? And as we allow the model to run, you'll see that they move, and when they move, they simply move through the space. Now, um, 
as they interact with other individuals in the model, they infect them as well, right? And so now you've seen that there's definitely more infection. And this model is a simple kind of spatial model. By the way, this already violates one of the original assumptions of the SIR model. The original assumptions of the SIR model is that the probability of any of these individuals interacting is the same, but it's not, right? Depending upon where I start in the world, I have a greater or smaller probability of interacting with an infected individual, right? But eventually, still, the model infects the whole uh, population. And you can see we get that nice kind of um, S-shaped curve that we're used to seeing from diffusion processes. Um, so uh, the main thing that we're going to investigate in, this, in, in the next couple lessons is looking at how the population density affects the actual infection rates. Right? So if you have more people living in a smaller space, does that mean the disease spreads faster or slower? So you might want to play around with that a little bit and just kind of like increase the population, right? And then see if it seems like it uh, happens faster and then decrease it, see if it happens faster and so forth, right? Um, and it definitely seems like at low populations, the disease takes a lot longer to spread, uh, which is interesting, right? Because there's actually fewer people to infect than there are at higher populations. But maybe it is simply a matter of population density and not as much a matter of the overall population. Let's investigate that.